Hello, everyone, and welcome to session three in the Gift of Life Empowering Living Kidney Donation Series. All lines have been muted, and today's session is being recorded. A copy of the slides and the recording will be available on the Quality Insights Network 5 website at the conclusion of this webinar. There will be a time for questions at the end of the presentation, so please submit your questions in the Q&A section. It should be at the bottom of your screen next to the chat box. Our speaker today is Glenna Frey. She's a nephrology nurse and living kidney donor. She's the co-founder and executive director of Kidney Donor Conversations, which is a nonprofit organization that provides education and support for living kidney donation. Today's session does offer continuing education credits for social workers. In order to claim those credits, you must watch the webinar and complete the evaluation and post-test questions at the end. We're gonna have a link to this evaluation that's available at the end of the presentation today. Um, and a link will also go out in an email um, after the presentation is concluded. Next slide, please. So today's presentation will cover the emotional and psychological rewards of kidney donation, but it's also gonna talk about the challenges donors may face. And we're gonna go through some of the assistance and protection programs for donors. We do wanna say that we recognize a lot of you on the call um, are working with patients who are in need of a transplant as opposed to those who would be willing to donate. However, our hope with this is that by equipping you with the knowledge of this different perspective, you're gonna be able to better assist the patients um, and their families as they try to pursue living donation. Overall, we're hoping to expand everyone's um, consideration to think about living donation even when someone does not have a friend or family member willing to donate. Um, so you're gonna be able to answer basic questions that may arise or guide them to ask better questions when they're going for their appointments. And today's session, of course, is number three in a four-part series, um, recordings, slides, and any supporting documents for sessions one and two are also available on the Network 5 website. And then don't forget to register for the final session, which is gonna be on January 10th at 12 p.m. Uh, that session is going to discuss strategies for finding a living donor. Um, and so without further ado, we're going to dive into giving life, exploring impact, benefits and considerations for living kidney donors. All right, so to start us out, we're gonna have a polling question. And that polling question is, what is your comfort level with guiding patients and their families towards assistive programs for living donation? Your answers are comfortable, somewhat comfortable, or not at all comfortable. So as Elizabeth said, in session two, we discussed the process of donating a kidney. And in session three, the focus will be again on the kidney donor, but exploring the risks, benefits, reimbursement, and resources available to them. The more you know, the better you may be able to guide your patients, um, their potential donors, and just be more comfortable with some of the conversations that you're having. And... The polling question uh, answers are about 40% about are somewhat comfortable or not at all comfortable, and about 20% are comfortable. So hopefully um, we can um, talk about some things today that might be helpful and uh, increase your comfort level going forward. I'm having an advanced problem. Let me try again. There we go. So people often ask me how I feel with only one kidney. And honestly, I feel the same as when I had two. Um, 
has my life changed since donating a kidney? Well, actually it has because I started a nonprofit to support donors. I provide education about living donation and I advocate for changing some laws to support living donors and those who need a kidney. But physically, I'm not really different unless you count some of my belly scars that I have. I've learned a lot in the past six years since I donated and um, you can live a healthy life with one kidney. So how can a kidney have the longest life in the recipient once a donor has given it away? We don't often talk about that. We're, we're often very just focused on the donor living a long life. Um, so how do we help the kidney live in the recipient as long as possible? Currently, we use um, HLA tissue typing that matches donors and recipients. Um, we use the word match, being compatible, um, but it doesn't always relate to how long the kidney will last. There's a slow long-term development of antibodies against the kidney in most transplants starting in the first three months. But there's now a technology that has made better matching systems available. High resolution tissue typing looks at the smaller parts of the HLA antigen called eplets. Even if the HLA is the same between the donors and the recipients, the eplets on those antigens may be different. And those are the little yellow uh, parts on the slide that you see. Yeah. So studies actually show that about 70% of transplants that have already been done have high eplet mismatch. And that mismatch means more donor specific antigens that will fight the kidney and more rejection. So what are the benefits of the uplet matching? Less antibodies, less risk of rejection, less graft failure, opportunity for possibly reducing immunosuppression, and because of that, then fewer side effects from immunosuppression medications. The National Kidney Registry has a program called Kidney for Life that uh, transplant centers that commit to providing eplet matching can be a part of. And they claim that a living donor kidney will last about twice as long if they have a low eplet mismatch. There are about 100 centers now that do that testing. So my recommendation is to tell your patients to ask their transplant center for high resolution tissue typing so that anyone who might be getting a living donor transplant can keep it as long as possible. So besides giving someone a healthy kidney, are there other potential benefits to donating? So most book donors say they have a boost in self-esteem. They have an increased sense of well-being, improved relationship with the recipient, and almost every donor says they would do it again if they could. A healthy recipient also provides benefits to families and society. Because the person who has kidney failure is now feeling better, they're able to travel, they can do more normal activities. They have less caregiver burden, improved quality of life, and less stress. For example, when my husband feels better with his transplanted kidney, that means he can do more and we can do more together. And he is less dependent on me, which honestly, I really like it when he's less dependent on me. When he's healthier, it affects both of our lives. But what are the risks of donating a kidney? The risk of death in surgery is about 0.03%. That's the same as childbirth. Um, now, I don't know how many of you have, have uh, children that you've given birth to, but I don't know if you stopped before you got pregnant and said, oh, you know what? I uh, wonder what my risk is of having to deliver this child. Um, it's about 
0.03%, the same as donating a kidney. And gallbladder surgery is actually higher at 0.18%. It's, um, there's a slightly higher risk of high blood pressure in pregnancy if you get pregnant after donating, and that's called preeclampsia. There's no harm to the baby. It's just they want people who have donated to be a little more closely watched during their pregnancy. And donors live as long or longer than the general population. Again, not because they donated, but just because they're healthier. The risk of end-stage kidney disease after 15 years of donating on average is about 0.27%. You can look at your personal risk as a donor um, by doing this risk index calculator at transplantmodels.com. Um, I know when I plugged in my numbers before donating, it came out like 0 0.03 or something. It was so low. I felt pretty, very, very confident that I would not end up in end stage someday. Um, you also, if you donate, you get additional points on the deceased donor transplant list if you need a kidney after donating. And some non-directed donors can actually get a living kidney transplant um, if you donate through like the National Kidney Registry. Currently, um, only about two years of data are required to be reported by transplant centers. And so as more information is gathered and researched about living donors, these risk models will actually become more accurate and more beneficial as we, as we get and learn more about long-term effects of donors. You may have heard of SRTR. Um, OPTN requires that the Scientific Registry of Transplants recipients provides information on the performance of transplant centers. And they're also building a living donor collective, which is a registry of both donors and potential donors that will help to learn more about the outcomes after donation. Currently, it's a voluntary program for transplant centers. I'm a member of the Living Donor Advisory Committee, and we're kind of exploring how we can get better follow-up, collect more data, and what actual data should be collected on donors. And we're hoping eventually that someday all transplanter, transplant centers will participate in this program. It's common knowledge that there's no charge for donor workup or surgery, but in reality, there are many other costs for donors. Um, the donor and the support person. So remember, for a donor to go through workup and surgery and post-op, they need to have a support person with them. So it's not just there are costs for the donor themselves, but the person helping them also. And this could be for transportation, hotel, food, time off work, maybe dependent care. And again, all of those uh, visits for workup, pre-op surgery, recovery, and follow-up. Uh, research has shown that about 75% of donors have an over $1,000 cost. About 25% have over $5,000. And about 13% have over $10,000 of out-of-pocket costs to donate a kidney. I think that's a lot of money to have to pay to donate a kidney. Um, and why should kind of everyone in the transplant process be paid except the person actually donating the organ? And should all donors be entitled to a cost neutral donation process? Should you not have to pay anything out of pocket to donate a kidney? Donors can legally be reimbursed for travel expenses, lost wages, and dependent care expenses. Um, the recipient can help them pay for some of these um, costs. You could also do fundraising, you know, get your family, friends, community involved uh, to help offset the costs. And then there's NALDAC, the National Living Donor Assistance Center. 
Uh, transplant centers should be telling people about NALDAC um, when donors go through the process um, and how to apply, um, but you must qualify. And all of these methods really rely on the donor and the, or the recipient to seek out funds. There's no like automatic built-in reimbursement for donors for all of these costs. And our second polling question is next. Can a patient submit a NALDAC application themselves? <clears throat> and this one's easy, it's either a yes or a no. So some people are surprised when I tell them that it costs me about $2,000 out of pocket to donate my kidney. Uh, NELDAC would not have provided me with any funds at all. And there are some discussions about making sure donors have a net zero cost when they donate. Again, meaning they don't have to pay any out of pocket expenses. And we'll talk more about um, some of those issues and concerns and more details of NELDAC as soon as we see our polling answers. And so most of you, 76%, believe that you that patients themselves can submit an application. So I'm so NELDAC goal is to reduce the financial disincentives to living organ donation. Priority is given to those who could not otherwise afford to donate. So the implication is that you have to be wealthy enough to donate. Um, this is a government funded program from HRSA and HHS. It is based currently on the recipient's income, and it can't be more than 350% of the current poverty guideline. So that would mean about a family of two could not make over $70,000. You can start the application when the workup begins, and it must be submitted before surgery. And I've also found out that non-directed donors can apply. This is a screenshot of the website. First of all, transplant centers must be registered to participate. And that registration can be found under the resources tab. You can find a list of all the centers that are registered under the top right resources. Donors can complete the form. They can either complete it online or um, print a paper version, but the uh, Form has to be turned in by the transplant staff. This is often the social worker, but they must submit the documents. And it says here that um, do not send completed worksheets to NLDAC. They do not accept applications from patients. So you can start the process, but you can't actually turn in the application. Uh, there's currently some legislation being considered to change from using the recipient's income to the donor's income. Um, and I always wondered, well, what if we just eliminated the income altogether and again, helped all donors with out-of-pocket expenses? So this is the HOLD Act. It's honoring our living donors, and it will help more donors qualify for reimbursement by changing the guidelines from the income of the intended recipient to the income of the donor. Um, I think it's interesting uh, looking at these issues that no one said to me before I donated, you know what, if you want to donate, it will likely cost you thousands of dollars. No one said that to me, but that's actually the reality. So the National Organ Transplant Act, or NODA, prohibits the 
purchase or sale of human organs. And there are penalties if you do pay for organs. Um, our last session, we talked about some of the cost savings when people get a transplant and they're um, able to get off dialysis. So what if those savings were actually used to incentivize living donation, not actually paying for the kidney, but incentivizing to donate? Do you think more people might donate? Here's some legislation that's being proposed to compensate donors. The first is the Living Donor Tax Credit Act. And this provides up to $5,000 of a one-time refundable tax credit for living donors. And uh, refundable tax credit means that you receive the amount regardless of how much income tax you pay. Another one is the HEROES Act, which stands for Helping End the Renal Organ Shortage. And in this one, all living donors would receive $100,000 in the form of a refundable federal tax credit. It would be applied though over 10 years in the amount of $10,000 per year. So there are also things available now, you know, those, those other things are hopefully going to make some changes in the future, but I want you to know what you can look at now to help with donor protections. Um, there could be employer benefits, transplant center, state, and registry benefits. So let's walk through some of these. The American Society of Transplantation, AST, created a living donor circle of ex excellence. It's a corporate recognition program that celebrates companies helping to eliminate barriers to living donation. So that means they have to have a written organ donor leave policy. And these companies are actually listed on the AST website. Um, and this gives a few more details about that policy. Um, they need to have salary for a minimum of four weeks um, and annual confirmation that this is being upheld and the policy is being uh, used every year. And this only can be for companies with over 100 employees. We look at state benefits. The American Kidney Fund has given us this nice uh, image of all the states and they've graded them on a scale of A through F. A is the lighter green, F is the dark blue. And it's based on their benefits of tax credit, job protections, reimbursement, FMLA, and insurance for living donors. And so it's evaluating how well each state does in those categories. If we look at the registries, uh, last time we've talked a lot about the Alliance for Paired Kidney Donation and the National Kidney Registry. So the Alliance has a Donor Protect Program and NKR has a Donor Shield Program. And I'm gonna go over a uh, comparison of those two. So both of them have lost wage reimbursement, travel and dependent care reimbursement, complication protection, and voucher programs. We talked about the voucher programs again in the last session. Uh, the Alliance also has disability insurance and support person insurance. And I'm using the terminology from their um, information. Um, there could be some over overlap in some of these protections, but this is, this is the guidance that they've uh, provided. And so if you look at continuing with the NKR specific protections, they have a remote donation option, best match. Um, and I think some of that is related to the applet matching, legal support, home blood draws, living donor support person protections, and living kidney prioritization. We've talked about some of those things already. The University of Chicago 
has a donor, I'm sorry, a project donor program that provides free access for weight loss and smoking cessation resources. We know that there's a fair number of people who want to donate, but are over the BMI required at a transplant center or um, are current smokers. And so they have, um, in order to encourage more donation and allow more people to qualify, they uh, can be entered into these programs and have assistance. And I've had heard some really good positive responses from donors who have gone through the program and how they're um, being helped with these resources. Again, the American Society of Transplantation uh, has come up with a living donor toolkit. There are two, one is financial and one is medical. And the thing I like probably the most about the financial toolkit is this living organ donor cost estimation worksheet. So you can print out this worksheet and even before the donation process, you can estimate what your costs might be based on how far you have to travel, how many visits you might have. Um, remember, some people have driving costs, some people have plane flight costs, uh, depending on where the transplant center is that they're having surgery. So um, I wish I would have done that uh, before I donated. Um, I didn't feel really compelled to, because I think I just was totally ignorant on what the costs of donating would be. I really had no idea. Um, this is just another general resource from the Multicultural Miracle Donor Foundation. This was started by a living donor and with the goal of informing, assisting, supporting, and advocating for multicultural living donors and they even uh, provide multicultural family uh, support for deceased donors. For donors using the National Kidney Registry website health questionnaire, they are automatically provided a living donor to talk to. This is called their Donor Connect program. And these are peers that will talk to people and answer any questions about living donation. And these peers come from either the National Kidney Foundation or the National Kidney Donation Organization. So think of it as just like a donor mentoring program. So here are some questions to ask patients to find out their understanding about the benefits, cost, and resources for living kidney donors. Uh, what have you been told about benefits, costs, financial resources, um, your state protections, registries, uh, any support resources, and do they know anything at all about high resolution tissue typing or applets? I think very few people um, have an understanding of that yet. And remember, their answers to all of these questions will help guide your education and what you can help them uh, provide more information on to help them un better understand what a donor needs to go through. And then they can better understand or ask questions, answer questions uh, when they're working with potential donors. So hopefully you've gained some information about more donor risks, benefits, and resources. Thank you again for your attention and time. And our third polling question is next. Okay, so now that we're at the end of the presentation, we're gonna go back to the original question. What is your comfort level with guiding patients and their families towards assistance programs for living donation? Comfortable, somewhat comfortable, not at all comfortable. So it's taken me several years, many years, to learn and understand information about living kidney donation. Hopefully you can use this presentation as a reference and resource for you, your dialysis staff, patients, and families. 
I think you'll receive even more beneficial information from our fourth and last session that will focus on helping your patients find a living donor. But the knowledge you obtain from sessions one through three will be invaluable as you have future transplant discussions with your dialysis patients. The results of the poll are definitely improved with uh, more people feeling comfortable and somewhat comfortable uh, with uh, talking about living donation and the assistance programs. Thank you. And back to Elizabeth. So just to um, highlight what Plena said, our, I know that there were some very technical things in this presentation in terms of the EPLIC count and other, and our goal is really just to provide you with um, general overall knowledge so that you can better answer the questions of patients or their families or their support people who may come in. Um, the slides for this presentation, as well as a recording, will be available on the Network 5 website. So you can reference back there for anything you heard today. Um, and at this time, we can take questions. Um, just as a reminder, if you will drop the questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, we will look there. Okay, so it looks like we have one question. How can we figure out if a transplant center participates in NALDAC? So the best way is to go to the website. And again, at the top right-hand corner where it said resources, you can look at a list of all of the transplant centers. But I think what's also important is if your transplant center doesn't participate in LDAC, NALDAC currently, they can register. So don't feel like that isn't an option um, if they're not listed. I would say go back to the transplant center and say, you know what, I want some funding resources through NALDAC or my donor does or whatever. And so please do whatever you need to do to register so that they can obtain those funds. Okay. And this is on the NALDAC website. You go there, right. you will see a list of participating centers. Yes. Gotcha. Okay, is a donor's ability to pursue assistance through uh, APKD or NKR dependent on the transplant center they are working with? It possibly could. Um, the Alliance, I believe all of their transplant centers that are part of the Alliance will get all of the benefits. National Kidney Registry, um, and probably I would say go to their website for the details. But what I find is there could be additional benefits depending on um, what the transplant center has available to them. For example, not all the NKR transplant centers do uplet matching. So only those centers would give you that kind of benefit. Um, so I think because the NKR is a little more complex that I would want clarity from the transplant center on what the NKR benefits are from them if they're part of NKR. Um, and that's again, something I didn't really look into as a donor, all of the benefits. And actually, I don't think NKR had any when I was a donor. So I would say that's the thing that would be really important for donors to know once there's an established transplant center is to be very clear on what their benefits are. I know for me, having priority to get a living kidney donor matters a lot um, versus some centers who would only um, be giving you, uh, you know, the living donor option or the deceased donor option. So I would say that's why all of these 
questions while this information is so important because it allows you then to have the power to ask more questions or the recipient or the donor to ask more questions of the transplant centers. Thank you. Um, and just as a reminder to, to go with that question, there is a handout on the Network 5 website for all of the transplant centers within Network 5 and which program they participate with. Um, so you can see that breakdown there and there are links to the different um, programs through NKR and the Alliance. So if you have any trouble with that, you can reach out to me. Um, and I know that the uh, networks three and four, you can reach out to your networks as well if you are looking for that information. Let's see, is there a list of these resources in a printable form that lists briefly what each organization does? It's confusing for donors and recipients trying to navigate similar but different resources. That I think is a great, a great point. I have an yes. idea of what you'll say, Glenna, but take I know. I'm gonna say that Elizabeth and I have talked about this. <laughs> And one of the things um, that we were talking about is after these four sessions, what do you need? You know, we know you're not going to go back into these slides every time you talk to a patient and look at these resources. So I think that's exactly the feedback we're looking for is what would help you. And if it's a one page for donor, you know, information, maybe a one page for recipient resources, that's something that uh, we could look at developing for you guys to make it much easier for you. And, and maybe in a format that you can hand to patients and families. And Elizabeth, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> I think that was gonna be my answer as well, is that helpful feedback. Um, I don't know of a place where it is all gathered together succinctly um, other than going through these slides again. So <laughs> that's helpful well, feedback. And there could be other resources that I haven't mentioned. You know, I'm not claiming to have an exhaustive list of the resources either. I've kind of pulled out resources that I'm more familiar with or that I've worked with or people that I've known. So um, there, there, there could be more. And um, But I think this is a great starting point for having those discussions, you know. We also want to make this fairly easy to understand and not overwhelm you too much with the detailed information too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how can a patient find out if their transplant center offers ethnic matching? Call and ask, call and ask. There is no listing. Now you can find through the uh, Kidney for Life, you can find out what centers participate in Kidney for Life, and that is on that website. What, but there could be other centers that do EPLET matching that aren't part of Kidney for Life, and those would not be listed there. So I think the easiest thing is just to go back to the transplant center and ask if they do high resolution tissue typing. If they don't know what you're talking about, which I've heard some people tell me that, they're like, they didn't, I, they didn't know what I meant. And I'm like, well, that means they're not doing it clearly. Um, so, you know, as a donor, I think it's really important. Um, I would have totally pursued this route had I known about it or if it was even, you know, if it had been available six years ago. Um, so I would, I think it's worth extending the life of the kidney to do these uplet matchings and would highly recommend donors and recipients look at centers that are doing it or ask their center how they can get the high resolution tissue typing done for themselves. And I think there could be, the more patients and staff are pushing for it, maybe it will, you know, help them to see this is important and, you know, where should we should be going for the future. Thank you. Um, this is a tricky one. 
uh, even if eflip testing is unavailable, is living is a living donor kidney still more likely to last longer than a deceased donor kidney? The simple answer to that is yes. <laughs> yes. So deceased donor is, so there's dialysis. What's better than dialysis? A deceased donor kidney. What's better than a deceased donor kidney? A living kidney. And what's the best way to match a living kidney is epilep testing. So that's kind of the hierarchy that I think of as going from, you know, okay to, to the actual best outcome we can have. And, and again, the goal is to, how do we keep the kidney in the recipient the longest? So they need fewer transplants over their lifespan. Um, so thank you for, for asking that to kind of bring it all in perspective again. Okay, so last call for questions for Glenna. I'm gonna keep an eye out. I don't see any right now, but I'm gonna keep an eye on the Q and A um, just in case. We can move on to the next slide. Um, this will have the evaluation and post knowledge check. So you'll go through the evaluation and I believe it links you straight to the post knowledge check. Um, and Lori has graciously put a link that is in the chat as well. You can also use your phone and go through the QR, use the QR code that's on the screen. Um, again, CEs are available for social workers for this presentation. Uh, we will send out an email with these links as well. Um, the recording will be available on the Network 5 website. So please do that and leave your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we wanna be bringing you information that is helpful to you. Um, so we will leave that. And just a reminder as well to register for session four, which is finding a life-saving match, strategies for finding a living kidney donor. I just want to highlight what Glenna said earlier. I think this is the one that is going to really, really bring things home for you guys. We've talked a lot about sort of the problems and the, the challenges and the benefits and some things that can assist. Um, and now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of how do you guide patients to do that? How do you, um, where should they look, particularly if they don't have an immediate friend or family member. So I'm looking forward to that. Don't forget to register. Um, please fill out your evaluations uh, and send any emails to us if you have questions. Thank you so much for your time today and thank you, Glenna, for yours as well. We look forward to seeing you in January. Bye-bye.